Well, it's good to see everybody out this morning. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 7, if you would. Luke chapter 7, we're going to be reading verses 36 down through verse 50. And I want to say, boy, the choir did a tremendous job today. Thank you guys and ladies for singing for us. And uh, John for putting it all together. And uh, they're practicing really hard. We could use some more men. They did a great job, the men's section. There's only four guys in there. I was surprised that four guys could sound that good. And uh, But uh, if you're a man and you want to sing, I know John will take you. Uh, as long as you're not me, he won't take me, he said. That's the only guy that's forbidden from singing. But uh, Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. We're going to look at one of uh, the, the most interesting accounts in the Bible that deal with our forgiveness and what, what the results of the gospel are. I want you to notice what Jesus what happens here. It says, one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table at the Pharisee's house, house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with, her hair, with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, who, he, uh, he would have known uh, what kind, uh, what sort of woman this was and who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, say it, teacher. So Jesus said, verse 41, a certain money lender had two debtors. One of them owed 500 denarii, the other 50. And when they could not repay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one who uh, I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sin? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Uh, before we get into this passage and how it applies to, to us as a church today and to our individual lives, I'll, I'll just watch, let's just kind of walk through this passage just, just for a moment and kind of capture uh, the, the picture of what's going on here. First of all, Jesus had been asked to eat at the home of one of the Pharisees. Now, that was very common practice, and, and the motive is, is for it is, is a little bit unclear, but it's a very common practice. It could have been that the Pharisee was genuinely interested in what Jesus had to say and who he was. Uh, you may have heard him teach at the, uh, at the synagogue and thought, I, I needed to find out more about him, and so he invited him to his house, as, as maybe you and I would do. You know, uh, the other day, uh, yesterday, Carl and I went up to meet with one of our church planning strategists here from the state of Illinois. We wanted to get to know him better. We and find out what's happening in our state regarding church planting in the Chicago area. So we went, we sat down, and there's probably no better place to get to know somebody than sit down across from a meal with them, isn't it? Uh, you know, you can do a lot of things with people. You sit down with a meal, it kind of relaxes you. I don't know, there's nothing that's more relaxing to me than pork barbecue. That just kind of relaxes me and gets me talking. And, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, so, you know, he might have been the Pharisee who was genuinely interested in what Jesus had to say and who he was. It could be that the Pharisee was inviting Jesus to his home in order to trick him. We know that in other passages, the Pharisees sometimes wanted to catch Jesus in something that he said. So, it could have been that rather than having a genuine motive, I want to know more about what you're doing, it could have been the Pharisee had an ulterior motive and said, well, I'm going to bring him over to the house, and I I'm going I'm to get him talking, and I'm going to get him relaxed, and, 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 and he'll say something that that'll trap him, and, and, and I'll get to trick him into to something that I might be able to accuse him of. And, and that was a frequent occurrence in Jesus' ministry. It happened frequently. A third option is it could be that the Pharisee was just kind of doing his duty. 
His job was as a, you know, a Pharisee. Here's a visiting rabbi that's come into the synagogue and it's taught and maybe Jesus, you know, maybe so, well, it's my duty to take him to dinner. It's my job uh, to go and, and, and just sort of feed him and, and just kind of go through the motions. And he, he really wasn't that enthused about it. He really wasn't all that excited about it. But, but, but it maybe it was just going to, I'll show him the minimum level of hospitality and kind of do my duty. It's my job and I'll just do it. We don't know what the, what the exact motive motive was, but, but he invites Jesus into his home. And, and uh, the fact that they're reclining at the table, and then later on, we even have an uninvited guest. Isn't that weird? What would you do if an uninvited guest, this woman kind of walks in, not invited, not, 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 not supposed to be there, just kind of wanders in. I mean, have you ever had anybody just while you were sitting there having dinner with somebody, just had a stranger wander into your house? Well, it kind of looks like what's happening here is this is a little bit more of a formal type meal. This isn't the same as just inviting somebody over to your house to eat. That, that this was a frequent occurrence in the first century. They would invite the rabbi over, but then the home was open. People could come in and out. It was an opportunity for them to kind of uh, continue their teaching and get an opportunity. And the fact that they're reclining rather than sitting at the table indicates this is a little bit more uh, of a formal type situation. While they're eating, this woman comes in. Now, there's something you have to note about this woman. The Bible makes it very clear that she was well known for her sinful lifestyle. The specifics aren't mentioned. Uh, I think it's very interesting that in some cases in the New Testament, the Bible will tell us the specific sins that a person committed. More often than not, the Bible just says this person was a sinner. In this case, this was a notorious sinner. This was somebody that the moment she walked in, the rabbi recognized this is a woman who has a bad reputation. Um, I remember a, a, a couple of years ago, I was up at the house, uh, up at the uh, home visiting my mom, and she was telling me uh, her neighbor lent her a book. There was a famous madam in our town. If you don't know what a madam is, don't worry about it. But anyway, she's a fa famous madam uh, in our town lady of the evening, a lady of real repute, whatever you want to call her, all right, named Judy Jordan, and, and she's quite famous uh, in our town. And she had written a biography. All the men in town were worried that she was naming names, all right? I'll be honest with you, that's why my neighbor had the book. Uh, he went over to get it, make sure his name wasn't in there anywhere. And, but Lynn, it, this was the kind of woman we're talking about. This is a woman who has a notorious lifestyle. Now, specifically what she was doing, some people have said she was a prostitute. That's not clear in the text. The Bible never makes that clear. But she was someone that when you recognized her and you heard her name and you saw her, you knew this was a woman who had a bad reputation. She was a sinful person. Now, again, what the nature of it was wasn't clear. It could have been that, you know, the Jews had kind of two levels of different kind of sinfulness. One was what you might call ceremonial uncleanness. They had touched a dead body. They, they had come across something that was declared unclean. They, they, had, they had been too close to a pig. Uh, all of these kind of things that could make you ceremonially unclean and keep you away from the temple. A far more serious issue are moral failures. These are places where you've actually committed the sin. Jesus indicates that what this is is a moral problem. It's not just a ceremonial uncleanness. It's not just that she hadn't met one of the purity standards in the law. She hadn't washed her hands right. She, you know, had touched a, a something she wasn't supposed to. This was something she had actually done because he mentions that her sins were many. Her moral failures here are many. Moral uncleanness uh, it, it are, are things like adultery, murder, lying, all of the different things we could think of, of breaking the Ten Commandments, if you, if you will. So this is a woman who has a notoriously uh, bad reputation reputation who comes in the room. When she comes in, she is visibly and emotionally moved. There's two really powerful images of her in this passage. First of all, she washes his feet with her tears and dries them with her hair. It was standard in that day and age, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a few moments, when you came into a home, because you wore sandals and you were out on dirt streets, generally you would come into a home and they would wash your feet or you would wash your feet. And uh, it's very obvious that that had not happened. And at the end of the meal, this woman comes and she takes, and she's, she's so moved by by the presence of Christ, 
She's so moved by being in the presence of the Savior that she's moved to tears and she's weeping and, 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 the, and the tears are so heavy that she wets his feet and she washes and dries them with her hair. And then she takes his feet and anoints them with, al with an alabaster jar of perfume. Now, now, in other passages, there's a couple similar passages this in the other Gospels, and, and they're not the same account, but, but, but a similar situation when somebody brought an alabaster uh, um, uh, bottle of, of uh, a perfume, and the Bible indicates to us that it would have been worth about 400 denarii. Now, let me put that in American terms. That's about a year's and a half's worth of wages. Basically, what you made in that day was about one denarii a day. So, this is, a, this is about a year and a half's worth, a little over a year's worth of, 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 of uh, uh, wages in order to buy this perfume. This is an expensive bottle of perfume. Nate, if you buy uh, your new bride a bottle of perfume that expensive, you will, you will cover a multitude of sins, all right? And uh, th th this is a very valuable uh, 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 spice. This is a very valuable perfume. She is moved to great uh, gratitude. Now, it could be that she's coming there because she knows she's a sinner and she needs forgiveness. It could be that she's already received the forgiveness and she's moved with gratitude. Whichever way it is, regardless of why they came, if she came in, she is deeply moved and so is the Pharisee. Did you notice that the Pharisee, though, rather than being moved to go, oh, isn't it awesome that this woman has been forgiven of her sins, that she's being, you know, isn't it awesome what God is doing in her life? The Pharisee, he gets upset about the whole situation. He begins to look, and he concludes in his own mind that Jesus must not really be a prophet. He couldn't really be a prophet because two things. First of all, a true prophet would know what kind of woman she was. She would know uh, what kind of lifestyle? You know, the whole idea of a prophet was that they had been talking very closely to God, and God was revealing things to them. Surely a true prophet would know that this woman had lived this horrible, notoriously sinful lifestyle, and, and, and wouldn't, uh, uh, and, and the second thing is, a true prophet, because he knew who she was, wouldn't let her touch him. A true prophet would try to stay away from that and avoid that. But Jesus steps into the situation, and, and what's amazing is Jesus not only proves that he knows who the woman is and what she's done, but he also shows that he knows the Pharisee's thoughts. The Pharisee hadn't said anything out loud to Jesus yet. He's just thinking in his head, doesn't he know what kind of woman's touching him? Doesn't he know what kind of life she's lived? Now, by the way, that should have immediately brought conviction to the Pharisee. The moment that he realized that, that Jesus was uh, reading, you know, knowing his thoughts and knowing what the intentions of heart were, should have indicated that this guy really does. This guy is on to something. But Jesus then also indicates that he knows exactly what he's going to do. So he says, I've got something to say to you. The Pharisee says, well, go ahead and say it then. If you've got something to say, go ahead and say it. And Jesus as he very often does, tells a parable. And he tells the parable of a money lender that has his owed money by two different people. The first owes 50 denarii. Now, uh, that's about two months worth of wages, uh, about two, a little, little short of two months wages. The other owes 500 denarii. That's about a year and a half's worth of wages. Neither of them are able to, to pay the debt. That's the key. If you look at these two people that owe their master this amount of money, the one who owns the little debt and the one who owes the big debt are really both in the same boat. They owe different amounts of money, but the reality is, is neither one of them are able to repay. And so the master does something that is completely driven by grace. That is, it, it, it's, he doesn't have to do it. He's not required by any law to do it. He, he decides, I'm going to forgive their debts. And he forgives them. He says, you don't owe a single dime and, uh, you know, go and basically be free. You, you don't have to pay the debt. And Jesus asked the question, now, which of them is going to show the more gratitude? And, and, and which of them, uh, he says, uh, uh, he says uh, uh, which of them will love him more? In other words, which one of the servants is going to love the master more? And the Pharisee says, well, I suppose it'd be the one who owed the bigger debt, the one who owed the 500. And he says, exactly. 
Then Jesus goes on to make a comparison. And this is probably one of the most pointed places in Jesus' ministry. Where he, he, he says, look, to the Pharisee, when I came in, you gave me no water to wash my feet. Now, that was a, not a required thing in Jewish law. You'd have to do it. But it was a polite thing to do. It was the thing that was kind of expected that you would do. When you came in, generally, the master would either himself get down and wash your feet or have a servant of his get down and wash your feet. It just made perfect sense. You know, if someone comes over for your dinner, house for dinner, uh, I know when I was a kid, if I went over to the neighbor's house to eat, they would often say, well, you know, the restroom's down the hall if you want to wash up and get ready for dinner. And you go down, wash your hands, and, and do all of those kind of things, you know. And, and and uh, it, it's just kind of a, an area of politeness. It's an area of hospitality. He says, you didn't do any of that for me. You, you didn't offer me any water for my feet. But then he says, this woman, she's got down on her feet, and she, she has washed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. She's shown this amazing gratitude for what he says. Then he says oh, to the Pharisee, uh, not only did you not give me any water, you didn't greet me with a kiss. Now, by the way, I'm kind of glad we don't greet the brothers with kisses anymore, do we? I remember one time I, I was preaching in a church down in Wellsburg, West Virginia. To preach a revival service down there. And this was an old country church, just to be very honest with you. And they, they did some things a little bit different. And they, they still practice, and this is fairly common in parts of West Virginia, they will greet you with a holy kiss. And what that means is when you walk in and they don't shake hands, they kiss you when you walk in. And the dudes kiss you and the women kiss you. And, and uh, I'll never forget, one of the deacons asked me, how long should you kiss the sisters? And I said, as long as your wife, you know, you and your wife will figure that one out, all right? Uh, that's probably a bad idea. But they would greet you with a holy kiss. That was a common thing. That's what they did in there. It was a sign of hospitality. By the way, there was nothing sexual about this. This wasn't anything weird. This was just the culture. It was kind of like our shaking hands, our greeting a person with a hug. Uh, it, it was the idea of affection and reception. He says, you didn't, didn't greet me with a kiss. You didn't show me that you were happy to have me in your house. But this woman, she's been kissing my feet. <laughs> He says to the Pharisee, no, 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 but you didn't, you didn't bring me any oil to anoint my, my head with. Again, not considered required, but again, a polite thing to do. And this woman here has taken an incredibly expensive jar of perfume. One that, depending on really what her sin was and who she was, may have represented far more than we can ever imagine. She's poured that on Jesus' feet and anointed his feet. In other words, she has shown him genuine gratitude and love and affection. Everything that the Pharisee, the Pharisee's just going through the motions. She is showing this deep, deep love and affection and gratitude uh, for Jesus. And so, uh, all of these things demonstrate her humility, her gratitude, while the Pharisee only shows the bare minimum. So, he concludes the pa a passage by announcing her forgiveness. Now, 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 different Bible commentators see this different ways. Some have seen that Jesus is saying, because of your love, because of your humility, because of your gratitude, you are forgiven. Others are saying he's already, he's just announcing what he already knew, that she'd been forgiven before she ever walked in. She's, she's coming in as a result of being forgiven, showing his grace. And Jesus is just saying to her, you indeed, it's true, you have been forgiven. Whichever way it is, it's good news, is it not? This woman who had walked in broken, this woman who had lived this terrible, notorious lifestyle has received forgiveness from the Lord. She has been forgiven of all of her sin. There's three really key truths that we learn in, that, in, this, in this parable. First of all, there is a relationship between our spiritual condition and our actions. That's very clear from this passage. While we are not saved by our good works, our works and our actions do reflect the condition of our heart. When we're lost, we do the things that reflect. Lost people act the way they do because they're lost. 
when we are saved, when we've been forgiven, that should that change in our heart. That fact that we've received forgiveness should change the way we live. This woman has received forgiveness, and now her actions are changed. She wants to come in, and she wants to worship God. She, she displays a humble and a loving heart. She's filled with gratitude for all that has God has done for her. I, I'm convinced that, that the deeper we understand the depths of our own sin and the grace of God, the more we'll want to serve Him. You hear that? One of the reasons why we have a service problem in the church, and, we, and by the way, every church in America has a service problem. <laughs> Every one of them. I, I, I talk to pastors all the time. Every one of them. The most common thing we talk about is, man, I can't get people to sign up to be a nursery worker. I can't get them to sign up to be a Sunday school teacher. I can't get them to do this. I can't get them to do that. How in the world are we supposed to get all of this stuff done if no one is signing up? One of the reasons why I think that it's, people are reluctant to, to serve is they've really just not come to terms with how incredible of a depth of sin that they've been forgiven for. If we would understand all that Jesus has done for us on the cross, if we understood really how wretched we really were, really how bad we really were, and how incredible it is that God would reach down and save us, man, we would want to we'd want to shout it from the rooftops. We'd want to serve in every way. We would be we would be moved to to just an incredible compassion uh, uh, for for other people and and for the things of God. But but because we don't we often are more reluctant than we begin self. This has been an area of uh, neglected by the church for, for the past 50 years. We're so eager. You know, sometimes we don't like to connect works and salvation because it sounds like we're saying that you earn your salvation. I'm not saying that. You don't earn your salvation by your good works. But if your salvation does not produce good works, it's not really salvation. You've got something else but it's not true, genuine salvation. It always results in good works. So, there's this connection here. The reason this woman acts the way she does is in response to what Jesus is doing in her heart and what He's doing in her life. Amen? And if you say, well, man, I, I'm really kind of in a dry spot right now. You know, you can be saved. There's moments where I go through dry spots. Cliff goes through dry spots. John goes through dry, dry spots. We all go through dry spots in our life, you know, where, where you've been serving for a while, and for one reason, you kind of you start neglecting the things that kind of really energize your Christian life. You know, you begin to kind of drift away from your quiet time. You kind of stop reading your Bible. You, you, you kind of come to worship, and you kind of go through the motions, and you just go home. And, and the way to recharge that is come back and do, the, the, do those first things. Do those things that kind of stir up that first love in your life. You know, uh, start listening. Uh, I, I'll tell you one that I've done lately, okay? Okay. Um, and, uh, and, and this is just a little minor thing, but uh, you guys all know I go over and work out uh, four, four or five days a week. And uh, generally when I work out, I listen to music. I like to listen to music, right? And uh, it kind of keeps me focused. And I'll be very honest with you. Quite frankly, my, for a long time, my favorite kind of music to listen to was 80s uh, hair band music. That's what I grew up on, right? Cliff's giving me the old, <laughs> uh, uh, either hook em horns or or or, uh, or or rock on sign. I'm not sure. You know what I'm saying? But I would I would I would put that on, and I'd listen to me a little Bon Jovi, or I'd listen to me uh, not anchovies, Bon Jovi. Or I'd listen to a little bit of something kind of get me stirred up. But I realized something. I'm in there for about an hour every day, and that, that's really not edifying to my soul. Don't get me wrong; it gets me in rhythm. In fact, every once in a while, I sing. All right, and uh, which is kind of the reason I work out alone a lot. All right, and uh, but uh, but anyways, the, the bottom line is, I, I thought, well, maybe I need. So I just started flipping over my Pandora, and I put on some Christian music, Christian rock music, by the way, not just you know, kind of hard to work out the Southern gospel. You just kind of. Be I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, the Southern Gospel is good music, but you can't work out to it. I mean, I just promise you, you can't, all right? Uh, but some of the new Christian rock, you know, and, and what happens? You know what happens is I find that that starts moving me to have a, man, by the time I walk out of there, not only have I had a physical experience, but a spiritual time too. In fact, a couple of times this week, I found myself praying about things while I'm working out. Not just praying. Sometimes I pray that the workout will end. 
Lord, help me not to die while I'm doing this. All right? And uh, the other day, I ran into Bert Draffin over there. If you guys know Bert, Bert's in shape. All right? Bert was working out like crazy. He's on kind of the same workout schedule that I'm on. And so I tried to keep up with Bert. At the end, I was praying, Lord, make Bert fat and make me like Bert. All right? You know what I'm saying? All right? And uh, th- anyways, uh, but uh, you get what I'm saying? It, what happens is sometimes we neglect those things that we know that will stir our souls. We neglect the Word of God. We, don't, we stop reading the Bible. We stop studying the Bible. We stop doing those things that God. So, so he's reminding us here there's a relationship between our spiritual condition and our action. There's a second thing. And maybe this is the most glorious truth in all of it. And I think this is probably the central truth in this passage. Is that God's offer of forgiveness extends to all people. It extends to all people. It's clear throughout the parable and the dialogue that Jesus offers that forgiveness is being offered both to the Pharisee and to the woman. Some debate whether or not the Pharisee received forgiveness. I really don't know. You know, in the parable, both people have been forgiven. One's been forgiven for a little bit of sin, and one's been forgiven for a lot, but they've both been forgiven. And it's possible that this Pharisee has been forgiven of his sin, but but, but because they're little, he doesn't really understand how incredible that is. And, and what's happened is, is, is he's, he's not really thought about how deep of his sin. The, the most surprising issue for the original audience is that the sinful woman would be offered forgiveness at all. Quite frankly, in the Jewish concept in Judaism in Jesus' day, this was a person who really didn't have much hope. She had been a, lived a notoriously sinful lifestyle, and she'd have been so far on the outskirts of Judaism, it'd been hard, perhaps even almost impossible for her ever to come back to the inside. And here is Jesus saying, you are forgiven. No matter how big or how little your sin, if you're a person that's only sinned a little and, and there's only 500 denarii worth of sin in your life, just a small amount, amen. But if there's a whole bunch of it, I got good news. Jesus still offers you. You know, how about a big or a little your sin is, Jesus offers you forgiveness. Now, I want to say something else. It doesn't matter how much you've sinned. The reality is, is the price was still the same. Here, I think we make a mistake as Americans sometimes. I I, I fall in this trap. I think some of us do. We look at Jesus' death on the cross, and we say, well, you know, I'm not big of a sinner never killed anybody, never committed adultery, never did the big things, you know, told a few lies, did a few things here, did a few things. My sin was kind of little. So my part in the death of Jesus was just a little bit. I got got news for you. If you were the only person that, that Jesus was dying for on the cross, he still had to die for you. You all follow on that? It's almost like, well, if, you know, if, if he was only my sin that he was dealing with, well, he wouldn't have to die, you know. He might have to get a splinter. It'd be just a little bit of suffering on my part. I don't have a big contribution. No, your sin nailed him to the cross. That's how big of a deal it is for, Jesus, for, for God. Our sins, there's not big and little in God's eyes. It's just sin, and it needs forgiveness. Uh, and, and so, uh, God offers forgiveness according to His inexhaustible grace and according to the finished work of Jesus on the cross. That's good news. I was sitting there with Dennis yesterday. Carl, I don't know if you had still been there with this part of it, but, but he was talking about Chicago. Let's be honest with Let's be honest for me. Can we just, can we just talk for a moment as a church? Chicago is kind of a distant place to us. When, when I remember when you guys called, when you guys first contacted me to become your pastor, the only place I knew in Illinois was Chicago. My brother lived up there for a while, the only place I'd ever gone. You know, we, we'd go up north, we'd cut across, to, I guess, what is that, Interstate 90 or something from Ohio, come all the way across to Indiana, go up through Gary, go up through Hammond, uh, go into Chicago. The only part of Indiana, Illinois I had ever heard of was Chicago. And most places in the world, if you tell them you are from Illinois, what do they say? Oh, you're from Chicago. 
That's the only city there that anybody knows of. And we come down here, and we're very distant from that. We're very far away. We feel like we're a long ways from all of that. And everything we see about Chicago here is negative. Think about it. Have you seen anything positive about Chicago on the news? You never heard anything positive about it. Well, there's a murder here. There's a murder there. You know, if you really looked at it, Chicago's about, you know, there's a big murder problem. It happens in a few neighborhoods. But there's millions of people living in Chicago that have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're in the set. We could go around the world and find all kinds of people who have never heard the gospel. We can drive six hours and find the same problem. Lost you know, lost as you can possibly imagine. And, and, and we were talking yesterday, we were sitting there with our zone coordinator and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Dennis Connor said, he said, we, we're in zone one. They're Chicago's zone one, we're zone 10. He said, you guys are the end of the line. I said, we're not the end of the line. We're the beginning of the rope that's trying to pull everybody else through. <laughs> guys, Listen. If that city's ever going to change, somebody has to go tell them about Jesus. We can sit there and look and say, man, alive, how awful that city is. But you know what? God's got a plan for the people in that city. He's got a, people for, he's got a plan for the people in Metropolis. He's got, he's got a desire to reach with forgiveness. And we can sit there and say, man, look at all of the bad things that go on up there. How are we going to resolve that? The, the answer isn't greater law enforcement. The great answer isn't getting a new mayor. The answer isn't fixing the political structure. We can say all of those things are bad. All of those things have problems, right? All of those things, by the way, are symptoms of the real problem. And this real problem is we are lost and need to hear the gospel. And so what has to happen, the way do you fix the problem? By the way, this is the way you fix America's problems. I, I got news for you, all right? You can get mad at me, and you can write me a letter, and you can send me an email or a Facebook post. If you think that Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump are going to fix America's problem, you're nuts. You can kick out all of the Senate and all of the House of Representatives and replace them all. You can replace everybody on the Supreme Court, and you could put on all God-fearing Southern Baptist leaders, you will not change America. You don't change the problem by dealing with the symptom. <sighs> I went to the doctor the other day. I, I've lost some weight. I've been getting in shape. My blood pressure's down. Doc said, you can cut back one of your blood pressure medications. That's the first time I've ever heard that in my life. Normally, when I go in the office, Randy says, you're fat, your blood pressure's too high, take another pill. This time he said, hey, You've, you've, you've done this, and you've done that, and you, this has happened. Now we can cut back one of those pills a little bit. Hey, that's good. But here's the problem. That's because I didn't deal with the symptom. I dealt with the problem. Y'all following me? We can put a Band-Aid on America all we want. We're not going to fix the problem. As much as I love some of the things we— I, Man, I, I love Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan is one of my favorite presidents of all time. I think, I think the three top presidents in American history, all right, were, were, were George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Ronald Reagan, all right? And then we'll put FDR on there somewhere on, on the list just because he fought World War II and got us out of the Depression, all right? Uh, we've got to put him on there. Hey, here's the bottom line, though. As much as I love Ronald Reagan, he did not bring spiritual revival, didn't fix America. We were economically prosperous, but we were more immoral at the end of his rule and at the end of his presence than we were at the beginning. The reality is if we're going to fix the problem, we've got to fix it with the gospel. And Jesus, no matter how, did you know that Jesus loves the most depraved gangbanger in Chicago as much as he loves you? 
He loves that, 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 that drug dealer standing on the street of Chicago as much as he loves you. He loves that, that corporate uh, lawyer sitting in a penthouse apartment somewhere down in Washington or in, the, in, in the Chicago making more money than, than we could ever imagine. Do you know he loves him as much as he loves you? If we understand the grace of God, and that it'll propel us to understand that he will forgive anyone of their sin, no matter how depraved, no matter how rotten, no matter how problem, big of an issue that they have, Jesus extends his grace. By the way, that's for you. Maybe you're here today and you say, well, I only have a little bit of sin. Jesus offers you forgiveness. Maybe you're like this woman who has a lot of sin. Jesus offers you forgiveness. His offer of forgiveness extends to all people. I'm afraid sometimes as a church we forgot that. We think it extends for good people. One of the hardest issues we're dealing with in the churches in America today is the issue of homosexuality. How do we deal with homosexuality? Homosexuality is a sin. Okay? Let's make no bones about that. It's a sin. It's wrong. Here's our problem. We're trying to find a way to fix that sin problem but without the normal means of the gospel. I have a friend of mine who says, man, he says, I don't mind them coming to my church, but they got to clean up their life first. They got to stop doing those things before they got saved. Did you stop your sin before you got saved? That don't make any sense. In order for their life to be changed, they have to experience the forgiveness and grace of Jesus, but we tell them, you have to change before you get the forgiveness. That won't work. That's not what Jesus says. Now, I don't know all the answers. I'm not sure of all how we should deal with it after that, but I know this. The answer to that issue and to every sin problem, that same way with a drug addict. We take a person who's a drug addict or who's an alcoholic or, or, or a sex addict or any other kind of sin, and we say to them, how do you deal with that problem? You start with the gospel. You start with being forgiven. You start with being saved, and then your life will change. Then those things will be. And by the way, that's a progressive thing. You know that. There were some things that the day after you got saved, you stopped and never was a problem again. There were other things that you're still struggling with. And you and I know that. And we've got to be willing to deal with that. Sometimes I'm afraid. In our zeal to uphold righteousness, we turn salvation into a subtle works. Do this, 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 and this, and this, and then you'll be saved. No. The Bible makes it really clear. Turn from your sin and trust Jesus. That's it. Turn from your sin. Trust Jesus. That's the same for every sin, every sinner in the world. And when we do that, he forgives us. Amen. And then that produces the good works. That produces that gratitude. That produces that desire to worship him, to present our lives as an offering to him and say, here I am, Lord, whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to be, I'm in. I'm in. Lord, I just trust you and whatever you want me to do, I'm there. I'm going to just serve you. That's what this woman is doing. She's just bowing before Jesus. saying, Jesus, I'm so thankful. I'm so grateful for what you've done for my life. There's where we need to be, at the feet of Jesus. Not the Pharisee looking down, but the woman at the feet, begging and, and demonstrating our gratitude and our love for him. Amen. Let's stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we are thankful that it's not based on who we are, but who you are. It's not based on what we've done, but what you've done. Lord, we're so thankful that on the cross, you went and you paid for all of our sin. And Lord, if we were the only person on the face of the earth, Lord, you still would have went to the cross and you would have still died for us. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you today for your forgiveness. If there's anyone here today who has never come to know Christ, 
as their Lord and Savior. If there's anyone who's day has never repented of their sin and trusted in you, I pray today that they would come. I pray they'd know that your arms are wide open, Father. Lord, today you are we- ready, willing, and able to forgive them, not only of some of their sin, but all of their sin. And Father, I pray today that we would rejoice. I pray that as believers, those who have experienced your grace and forgiveness, we'd be reminded today when we leave this place, we'd want to serve you more than we've ever have in our past. Lord, drive us to your cross. Drive us into your arms today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.